Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Welcome back to another edition of the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm Ryan Mauser. Thank you all for tuning back in and giving a listen. We always appreciate it. And we got some no basketball going on right now, at least no NBA action for the moment, as we have reached the All-Star break, and we'll have the All-Star game on Sunday, as as well as the slam dunk contest and the three-point contest. Um, so some things I wanted to get into today on this episode is James Harden returned to Houston on Wednesday night after being traded to Brooklyn earlier on this uh, this season when he asked Houston to ship him out of there because he was not happy wanting to play there anymore. And so I wanted to, I'll, I'll start with there I'll start with that, but also what's going to be coming up is I want to do I do want to talk about the All Star Game and why I think it's it's a bad move for the NBA to be even hosting an all-star game while we're still going on in a pandemic and everything that's going on. But also I wanted to get into who's been the most disappointing teams so far in the first half of the season. I got a couple teams in my mind that I haven't talked about. I know I've shared uh, on the last couple episodes some teams who have struggled this season, including the Hawks, the Nuggets. But there's a couple other teams on this list that I made that have disappointed me the most, probably. So I'll share those ones with you guys. And I also want to know, and I want you to think about this throughout the show, and we'll, we'll finish with this. What's more exciting to you? A big three or a big dunk? Which one gets you more excited? Which one has a bigger impact, you think, on the game? We'll talk about that at the end of the show, so think about that. But right here, I want to start with James Harden going back to Houston and... Returning to the place where he played for eight plus seasons, and he did get a mixed reaction. Houston does have fans at the games right now. I know some teams still do not, and he probably would have got a little bit louder of a reception. I'd imagine had the stadium been full of fans. Obviously, that's not the case at the moment, as only some teams are allowing fans at the games. I'll take that out. But James Harden made his way back with the Brooklyn Nets to Houston. He uh, They ended up winning the game, which was not really a surprise because of the fact that the Rockets are are a hot pile of garbage as, at the moment, and they're not really expected to go anywhere. They'll probably be selling off some of the pieces that they can and just looking at going into full tank mode at the moment because they don't really have a shot at winning anything. Partially to blame is James Harden for the way that he orchestrated the roster and then at the very end decided he didn't want to be there anymore after giving it all he got, giving it giving it his all. But the 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 mixed reaction, I it's gonna happen. Fans is short for fanatics. So people are always going to feel a type of way when you tell a team you don't want to be there anymore. You don't want to play for them. You're 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 ready to move on. Fans don't fans are attached to a team more than the players a lot of times. And when a guy says that he doesn't want to play there anymore, he's turning his back on those fans and the team and they react a certain way and it's it's going to happen. It's it's happened all the time. So it's not surprising there. I mean, look at when LeBron James left Cleveland for Miami, his first return was 
a crazy night of course of booze, chants. It was it was an intense environment. I mean, Kevin Durant when he left the Thunder and he made his return with the Warriors to OKC, again, it was an intense scene. There was chippiness. Him, Russell Westbrook got into it a bit. The fans were all behind the Thunder, but ultimately both LeBron James and Kevin Durant won because the new teams that they were on were better than the team that they left. And that's just that's part of the reason why those guys chose to leave. They wanted to be on a better team. It's what James Harden chose to do when he said, I want to be traded. I don't want to play in Houston anymore. He wanted to go to the Nets. He saw the Nets as a better opportunity to win a title, something that he wasn't able to do in Houston. And that's about the only thing he wasn't able to do in Houston was actually win the title. Because for those eight plus seasons that he was there, the Rockets were one of the best teams in the NBA. They were truly the only challenger to the Kevin Durant led Warriors. And they were the team that pushed them the most. I mean, if the Rockets don't miss 27 straight threes, we might have them as an NBA champion. James Harden might have a ring and things might have turned out different for that organization and for their relationship. But that didn't happen and the Rockets ended up getting eliminated in seven games in that series. And you look at it and of course fans are going to react react a certain way, especially the first season where he comes back. And it's it's an emotional wound at the moment. It's it's still fresh. It was just happened a couple months ago. And they he kind of the way he left that organization wasn't the most proper way. It was he looked to show up to camp and to the games overweight. Didn't really feel like talking with anybody. He was not showing up for practice at one point. And so it was a rocky end to the relationship for what for for what was a really positive eight plus seasons. And if you look at it with Harden being there for eight seasons, he won an MVP. They didn't miss the playoffs once. He averaged 29 points per game for you. And he led the league in scoring three separate times. But you look at it, and again, he won an MVP. You were a playoff team every single season. You challenged one of the greatest teams ever and had them on the brink of elim- elimination. If a Chris Paul hamstring doesn't happen, you can make an argument that they do beat the Warriors. Granted, the Warriors had injuries on their own side, and they, they'll they argue that if they had Iguodala, it would have not even been a, been a close series. And all of that's, that's, all that's fine, and you can go back and forth with whoever, and it's a matter of what side do you root for where you're really going to get a couple of different answers. But there was some pushback because the Rockets did announce that before James Harden was going to come back, I think this was on Tuesday they announced, or maybe Monday, that James Harden's jersey would be retired by the the Rockets. Which is not surprising in my books. He's one of the greatest Rockets in history. One of three guys in their organization to win an MVP. But the thing that I, I, I have a pushback on is I don't like having the announcement that you're going to retire a guy's jersey while he's still playing. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that. I want it to be let, let the guy finish his career and keep going before you announce that, hey, his jersey will be hanging in the rafters one day. It's going to get retired. No one's going to ever wear that jersey number again. And I have no issue if you keep a player from wearing that jersey number and you say, nope, that one that one is off limits. We don't want anybody wearing it. But to come out and say that you're going to retire the jersey number while a guy's still playing and playing for a different team is something that I'm just, I'm not a huge, huge fan of really. In, it, it For no reason other than I want these guys to continue to play and not have to answer questions about feelings. How does it feel to have your jersey going to get retired? What What's your emotions like? going back and knowing that one day it'll be hanging in the rafters. I want these guys to play 
focus on what they're doing with their new club. There's always going to be the questions of what was your time like in Houston or in other situations where it's what was your time with Team X or Team A or Team B. But to announce that the jersey's going to be retired while the guy's still playing, I just I'm I'm not here for it. Joe Lakeup did the same thing earlier in the off uh, last year when Kevin Durant announced that he was leaving for the Brooklyn Nets, and he said that no one would ever wear 35 again, and that they would retire it and hang it in Chase Center. Which again, it's there's not a, a big problem with doing it. For me personally, I just I want the guys their careers to be over and finished before you start retiring a jersey for them. It doesn't matter if it's one season after they're done, but I I like personally to have the guy's career be over. And I get the aspect of you want to honor the guy while he's still here, because unfortunately in life it, it's it can be short. Things can happen, and you want to show your respect for the player and what they did for your organization. And that's all well and great, but it, it leaves a weird taste in my mouth when it's announced already that, yep, yep, Harden will have his jersey retired, or KD will have his jersey retired, when they're not on the team at the moment. And I, th- I think you should focus on the guys that you currently have. As well, the past is great, but you have a roster right now. And again, you can you can limit someone from wearing the jersey. That's fine. But for me, it's just... I'm not a huge fan of announcing a, a jersey retirement before it happened, before the career's over. And look, like I said, Harden is one of the best Rockets in the history of that of that organization. He did. He brought. He won an MVP with you, brought you to the playoffs, dazzled you with memories and moments, and that'll always live on. But for the fans' sake, I think you have to allow them to heal from that and not announcing that his jersey is going to be retired lets it build to that moment of like a welcome back of a, of a allowing him back into their circle because at the moment it was it was a bad breakup and a lot of times with these teams and when these guys leave it it, it can be a bad breakup or it, it, it hurts because you did love that player when he was playing on your team and that was your guy and then when they left it left a sting and for some teams, it's they were automatically taken out of a title contention, and now it was a tanking mode or a rebuild, and they weren't going to be in the playoffs or fighting for anything more than just playing games in the regular season, and that hurts. I mean, you look, when a guy such as the levels of a KD, a LeBron, a Harden, when they leave these organizations, it... It sets the it can set these franchises back for quite a bit. Depending on how your your run. I mean, you look at the Cavs. When LeBron first left and went to Miami, they were the worst team in the NBA. They had the number one pick a couple times. And yeah, they got Kyrie and they ended up winning the lottery and getting Andrew Wiggins again, although they ended up trading him because LeBron came back and they wanted Kevin Love to be paired with them. You look at that team and it was they were they were a mess. They were not a playoff team. When KD left the Thunder, they never really were a true title favorite. They can make they made the playoffs. They had some good wins. Russell Westbrook won an MVP for you. And you ended up going and getting Paul George and being a playoff team, but they never really felt like they actually had a chance at winning a title. Which is the ultimate goal as a team. And they've done well enough to adjust and trading away Westbrook to the Thunder and bringing Chris Paul and having that short stint of success with Paul, Shea Gilgis Alexander, and playing, again, getting to the playoffs and having a bright future. And you look at them and they have all these draft picks stocked up. For Houston, they're still going through all of that. This is the first season of what's going to be probably a, a tough rebuild for the moment. They... They shipped out their star, and they brought in John Wall to try and reshape the team and getting rid of Russell Westbrook, who was a guy that Harden wanted brought in, and it was brought in at 
no expense to anything else, but get him here, and we want him here. And you look at it, and Harden leaving left behind a big mess for the Rockets to clean up. There is no Daryl Morey anymore. Mike D'Antoni was gone. So it's a new era for this team. And if you're those players and you're hearing how much they're going to honor James Harden and he's getting his he'll get his jersey retired it has to not it has to sting a bit because you want to sit there and go hey what about us like he left us we were on this team we were ready to roll and go into battle with him this season and he kind of told those guys yeah screw off i don't really want to play with you i don't think you have enough talent so it has to make you feel a certain way to where if if it was a couple years down the line and he was coming back and it was his making return after years away. And then you announced, yep, James Harden, tribute night after his playing career is over. And it's all about him, which they will still do when they actually officially retired the jersey. But it just seems a little premature to have happen already. Again, it's well-deserved for Harden to get his jersey retired. And the pushback of him actually getting the jersey retired is absurd to me. Because of the things that I laid out of him being an MVP for you. Sixth in franchises games played. Fourth in field goals made. First in three points. He has the accolades to get your jersey retired by an organization. It's without a doubt. He is one of the best Rockets players ever. For me, I would just rather you wait and not announce it until later on when his career is over because it's a it to me it's it's disrespectful to the players that are playing right now that go against that guy and are battling when he comes to town but teams have their own feelings of it about it and if you can announce that and get people revved up for a random Wednesday night game in March when your team is near the bottom of the standings and you can drum up interest for a game that maybe, besides the fact of him returning, has no real interest because of the fact that the team is so bad. I get it. It's, it, it's a business idea and a strategy. But you can also look at it and go, they're honoring a player and showing other potential players in the, in the future that, hey, when you become part of our organization you have a lasting impression with us. If you do things right and you win and you perform, we will honor you. We we will show our gratitude to you. But it's also the sense of, what about the players that are playing right now? What about the John Wall who had to go against Harden after he told, basically told him, you're not good enough for me to play with? What about Daniel House who had good moments with Harden but is now battling him, and it's it's a weird spot to be in, and I just feel it's unnecessary to announce, hey, his jersey will be hanging up in the rafters here. It's it's unneeded. It's known that it's going to happen. Why be so quick to announce it is my only thing. And it can be dumb that, hey, it's not like they're hanging the rafter that night. I, I get it. But it comes with a certain added layer that this guy who's coming back and being the opponent is being given this treatment when he's earned it. And that's there, of course, he's earned it. I just say, pump the brakes, let's wait a little bit, and let's beat this guy first. Maybe let's 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 try and get one back because of the way he exited. And then later on we can honor him and say oh how great of a rocket he was thank you for all the memories but for the fans they still have some resentment to him about the way that it ended now anyone claiming that he was a fraud for them or we never needed him that's the dumbest thing that I could hear is of course you needed him he was an MVP he's one of the best players in the NBA you don't you don't get better by losing that guy you don't just wipe away the past that he did for you because now you're mad that he left. But at the same time, be aware that there are some hurt feelings, that people are upset. 
they're frustrated. Their team is in last place or close to last place right now. And the guy that kind of caused them to, that pain is returning. And, yeah, you can cheer for him and give him a tribute video of welcome back. But also pull back a little bit about it. At least wait a couple years before you announce it. The guy is still playing. He's what would happen if the Rockets faced the Nets in the finals? Let's just say, and you're now talking about his jersey being retired when you're facing him in the finals or a playoff series. It, it, obviously, that's not going to happen right now, and probably won't happen while these two teams are at their current rosters. But it just seems like it's a ne- unnecessary narrative to put out there for the moment. But Harden does deserve the respect from Houston and for the years he put in with them. And for that, congrats on a great career in Houston. Hopefully, his time with the Nets ends a little bit better than his time in Houston did. But that's for another day, and we'll see how that goes. Right now, the Nets have been rolling with Harden and Kyrie. KD's been out dealing with the hamstring injury, so we'll see what happens with the Nets. It's just one of those things that kind of irks me a bit. I just don't I don't see the point in announcing it before the career is done. We're going to take a quick break and then coming up I want to talk about some of these di- Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All right, welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. So I discussed why I wasn't a huge fan of the Rockets announcing James Harden's retirement, jersey retirement that they were going to do. And for me, it's just a small issue I have, and nothing, nothing crazy, but it, it's, it's, it's a bad. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth. What also has left a bad taste in my mouth is some teams who I had high hopes for coming into the season. Now we are officially at the halfway point of the season because it is the All-Star break, so we we call it the halfway point. And these teams have had a rough first half and have been a bit of a disappointment for me. And I want to share with you who I think those teams are and also maybe what, what we can expect for them heading in to the second half of the season once we get games back going next week as we are in the all-Star break at the moment and have the All-Star game and All-Star festivities on Sunday. Late, the next segment I do want to talk about is why I think that there should not be an All-Star game and I think it's a terrible look for the NBA to have with everything that's going on. So we'll get to that one after this. But here are some teams that I think have been the biggest disappointments so far this season. The first team I have, the Dallas Mavericks. Now, last season, the Mavericks, they looked like they had a bright, bright future. And they still obviously do with with Luka pairing him with Chris Stapps Porzingis for the time being, as I talked about a couple episodes ago, the possibility that the Mavericks could be trading him. But last season, the Mavericks finished as the seventh seed in the West, and they would go on into the bubble and face the Clippers and pushed them to six games and 
had a the, Luca had the buzzer beater oh, for uh, in game 2 against the Clippers which was one of the top moments of the bubble you thought heading into the season that they had a really good shot at moving up into the standings this year and even pushing maybe for a 4 or 5 seed instead they made some made a couple moves in the off season and they also they were banking on Giannis becoming available. They didn't want to spend too much money in case they wanted to offer him a contract next off season. Obviously with Giannis re-signing in Milwaukee, those plans are now off the table as he won't be leaving there for quite a while. But the biggest move that I thought hurt them was trading of Seth Curry for Josh Richardson. Seth has been a sniper for the Sixers, exactly what they needed. I always thought that the Mavericks wanted more shooting around Luka because of his playmaking ability and that he can get everyone involved so effortlessly that trading one of the best three-point shooters in the game didn't make sense to me. Obviously, he's not the greatest at defense, is Seth Curry. He's not going to be able to give you that every night. And I thought Josh Richardson might be a good piece to have and could provide some spark and energy shooting the ball, driving to the basket, just some energy plays. But it hasn't necessarily worked out for them. You're kind of waiting for them to figure it out. Dallas suffered a six-game losing streak, which Luka called out his team for being terrible. They had a, a they started 9 and 14 and had a really embarrassing loss to the Warriors early on in the season. 147 to 116, and the Warriors only had about nine guys dressed for that game. So it had been a bit of a rocky season. Now, again, I said they started 9 and 14, currently 16 and 16. And so you look at it and you go, okay, they're not that far out. They currently sit at the eighth seed. Excuse me, sits 18 and 16 currently. They have been coming on strong as of late, winning eight of their last ten. So you you can see that the pieces are starting to fall for them in the right way. But it was it was shocking that they got off to such a bad start. I mean, Chris Porzingis was missing up until about January, so they had that to deal with. And they just weren't in the right rhythm for them. So that's going to happen. Wait for your second best player to come back. He still hasn't fully looked healthy, so they do have a lot of positive that can happen right there. Another good thing for the Dallas Mavericks is that, they, yes, they like I said, they've won eight of their last ten. And they have the fourth easiest remaining schedule, so that can help them prop up some wins, push up forward, and maybe even avoid the play-in tournament. So if they can get to that sixth seed, which they're only... Th- two and a half games back of right now. So it, it can happen. It can happen at the snap of a finger that they can be right there. But they have been disappointing to watch for this so far, and part of it is the fact that when you watch Luka and you, you just expect him to just dominate and be able to carry the team kind of on his back in any game that he's playing in, they have a shot to win. And it just hasn't been the case. And again, he's young. You can't expect him to just carry a team all alone. But coming into the season, he was probably, if not the favorite, pretty high up there for MVP honors that he would be winning his first MVP this year. And it hasn't been a bad season in any sense of the way for him. I mean, he's an all-star. He's averaging 28.6 points per game, 8.4 rebounds, and 9 assists. And you look at that and you go, that's extremely good. But it hasn't felt that dominant force for him at all times. and So look for the Mavericks to have a turnaround second half and probably, I think, can get to that sixth seed. I'm going to stick out in the West. And I want to talk about another team that has a young star that you thought would be further up than they are right now. And that's the New Orleans Pelicans. Being able to have Zion for the entire start of the season, as last year in his rookie year, he missed uh, time up until about, I believe it was December or January, dealing with knee injury. 
So being able to have Zion fully for the season, you were looked at it, okay, they can figure it out. They can carve out the right roles for everyone. They brought in some different pieces. They traded away Drew Holiday in a four-team deal, brought in Steven Adams, brought in Eric Bledsoe, the pair with Lonzo, and Brandon Ingram signed a five-year, $158 million extension in the offseason. So they knew that they had their two core young guys in Ingram and Zion to move forward. Now they're sitting right now at 15 and 20, and things haven't necessarily clicked every game for them. They're in the 11th spot in the West, and again, not much is separating to the teams, and you do have the play-in tournament, with the, which can... If you're just in the tournament, you have a chance to make the playoffs. And for the Pelicans, making the playoffs would be a huge, huge get. Because you want those guys who have that playoff experience and be in the games and see what it feels like in the atmosphere so that when it comes time to when they are actually legitimate playoff team, that it's not their first go around and it's not the moment's too bright for them. Much like the Mavericks, you can look at the Pelicans as a team that has a truly bright future because of the fact of one guy. When you have Zion, when you have Luka on your roster, you are auto- automatically set to have a bright future as long as those guys stay healthy and continue to, de- to develop. But the key is you don't want those guys shouldering every th- all of the workload by themselves. And signing the extension for Brandon Ingram show- shows you the Pelicans want to have a duo at least. And they're two guys that play the game differently. They both can go get you a basket when they need to. Brandon Ingram has slowly and steadily increased his three-point range for the last couple seasons. And his mid-range shot is one of the top ones in the game, I feel like. You watch him, it's... And I don't want to I don't want to use this name and put a true comparison on him in the, this sense. But when you watch him and how lanky he is and that shot from the mid-range, it's KD-esque. Now, I'm not saying he's Kevin Durant by any means. But Brandon Ingram when he gets to his spot and he and he loads up and shoots, it's really tough to guard and it's a shot that if he continues and continues to develop, there's no telling how good he can be. And it seems like he's really gotten comfortable in New Orleans. I mean, he was the most improved player. And you would just imagine that he's going to continue to get to higher levels by being paired with a guy like Zion Williamson, who people are going to look at and circle on the chart as the guy to stop. Because that is a freight train coming at you when he goes downhill and attacks the basket. And there's nothing you can do about it with him. He's too big, he's too strong, and he's too powerful for you to stop. And when you foul him, you have to really hold him down to keep him from getting an and one. But with new coach Stan Van Gundy, it's taken some time, and they've gotten off to a bit of a slow start. And so you you anticipate they'll figure out things, they'll get more comfortable with each other. Lonzo has had a really, really nice season. His three-point shot has improved dramatically this season as he was, he's was he been working with the shooting coach and finding out what works for him and kind of tweaking his shot. You, you hear his brother LaMelo getting all the praise right now and well-deserved, and I've given my praise to LaMelo, and I think he's fantastic. But Lonzo this year has made a huge improvements in his scoring. He's averaging 14.7 points per game. But look at his his free throws up 21%. His threes up. His three per, percentages up this year as well. So you, you look at him and you see why the Lakers took him number two overall and ha- had high expectations for him. And it'll be interesting when he hits the restricted free agency this offseason whether you see a team try and pay him big and force the Pelicans to match it, if the Pelicans would match it, or if they bring him back. Because, again, they do have Eric Bledsoe now, who is a little bit older than Lonzo, and they play very differently. You would, you anticipate that the Pelicans would want to 
keep Lonzo around and pair him with Zion and pair him with Brandon Ingram, but at what cost? So the rest of this season is about learning and seeing what you have with these young guys and how they can continue to develop and get even better than they are. Again, you're sitting 11th right now. You're not too far out from the playoff spots and that play-in game. So the Pelicans do have a lot to play for and can show teams that they are a team you don't want to mess with. The last team I want to get to who is disappointing me probably the most out of these three teams. I'd say that I already I mentioned the Nuggets in the last episode. So I don't I don't I don't want to focus on them as being the uh disappointment cuz I've already kind of covered them. Same thing with the Hawks who had playoff expectations and just fired Lloyd Pierce. I wanted to focus on some new teams and a team the Bucks were going to be included until they rattled off five of six wins, so they've cleared their name out of my crosshairs. But the Miami Heat, the reigning Eastern Conference champions, who sit at 17 and 18 right now, have probably been the most disappointing to me because I really thought that they were going to build off that finals appearance and that it was more than just that the bubble was the right setting for the Heat. You heard that a lot. That the bubble, it, it kind of played perfectly into what the Heat culture is and that dog competing mentality and it was going to be, oh, that's that's the team you don't want to face in the playoffs. That's the team you don't want to face in the bubble. And they proved that by getting all the way to the finals, taking it six games before dropping to the Lakers. Jimmy Buckets played tremendous. Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero were snipers. Bam out of bio rattled off an all-star selection into a big contract extension. And so you looked at it and you went, okay, well, Miami Heat, they have now, they've now experienced a deep playoff run. They made it to the finals. They saw what it was about. They have Andre Iguodala for a full season, and you expected them to roll into the season carrying that with them. Unfortunately, that has not been the case for the Heat, and it, it's been a, a sluggish sluggish start at times and it almost seems that the bubble could maybe kind of wore them out it's a different setting that they're now adjusting to being outside of that and being in the regular season where you are traveling to different cities and different places and playing different teams in a different arenas it's not that AAU style basketball anymore and they also had the unfortunateness of being hit with COVID at different times throughout the season. Goran Dragic hasn't been healthy. Tyler Hero has now missed some games. But you almost wonder, have teams have teams kind of figured out Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero, who, in the bubble, they had really, really great playoff showings. And this year, it's been a little bit of a drop in production from those guys. And you wonder, are our teams kind of figuring those guys out? That, okay, if they're not shooting the three, if they're not making buckets, what are they doing? What are they giving you? Because in the playoffs, Duncan Robinson, 39% from three. It seems like he quite hasn't found that same stroke. It's not the same guy who can heat up at a moment's notice and make you pay. Now... They have won six of their last seven games to help themselves out and kind of find their footing again. And I just worry, did they dig themselves too big of a hole at the beginning of the season? They they have blown a couple games. You look at that Warriors game where they were up big and let the Warriors come back in and win it in overtime. The Heat are a well-coached team. They're well-run with Pat Riley at the top. And they have guys, and they have dogs, and they'll always give you a fight. But you kind of wonder, did, obviously the bubble, was it a big factor of everyone was kind of figuring out how to play in there? It was the right setting for them. You need the guys to step up, health being a big one, that if they can stay healthy and get all their guys fully back, can they make another playoff run? They still have Jimmy Butler. 
He is still the leader of the team. Bam is now locked up long term. He can continue to grow into his own. Do they have to trade either Duncan Robinson or Tyler Hero to really take themselves over the top and be a force in the East? They're sitting in the sixth seed right now. They're looking up at the Knicks, the Celtics, the Bucks, the Nets, and the Sixers. Knicks, you imagine, will fall off in the second half. I don't I don't see them being a top five team by the end of the season. The Celtics, who were a team that I could have thrown in here because of how hot and cold they've been, but I did kind of mention them in a couple episodes ago that they had some issues, so I didn't want to necessarily focus on them, but you look at Miami and they're going to need to turn things around. They're six and four in their last ten. Granted, six of seven in their last six wins in their last seven games, excuse me. So they're playing, heading into the All Star break on the right foot. It's can they take that leap? What do they need to do? I think you look for them to be active at the trade deadline, try and make a couple moves. Again, could, what could they get for a Duncan Robinson? What could they get for a Tyler Hero? Is it worth it to shop one of those guys for them? What what would they be able to get back with ruin the team chemistry? You you don't know, and you don't want to give up on young guys right away because they were key pieces to that finals run last year. But if they truly want to be title contenders once again and get back to the finals... You may have to part with one of those guys and bring in a guy who's going to help you out on defense a bit more and isn't so one-dimensional, if you want to say, because if Tyler Hero or Duncan Robinson isn't shooting great in the night, what else are you really going to get from them? They're, They're not great in points... Per game, twenty six out of thirty. So you you need you need a spark coming from them. You wonder if it's Goran being fully hot, healthy. Do you trade Goran Dragic and try and bring in something? Would Kyle Lowry fit this team? So I'd, I'd look for Miami to probably be one of the more active teams at the deadline, and we'll we'll cover the trade deadline here in a couple weeks once we get a little bit closer. But so those are my three biggest disappointing teams of the first half. All three still have the potential to make a lot of moves and rise up in the standings. But so far, those are the three disappointing teams for me. And coming up next, I want to talk about the All-Star Game and why I think it's a terrible idea that the NBA is even having it. It makes no sense. But also, what's more exciting that, that three kind of surprised or me that dunk. they've been so bad so far. We got the three point contest to start the, the dunk contest going on this we'll weekend. Get into those. So it popped in my head. Hey, and then also, which one is more exciting? Still think about it. Let me know which one do you look forward to watching more of the contest. But also, what's in better, game. a big dunk? What What do you a see as more important? We'll get to that all coming up. It's the we'll GSMC the Basketball end. Podcast. Brought Stay to tuned. you by the GSMC Podcast Network. We'll be right back. Stay tuned as this is brought to you by the GSMC basketball podcast on the GSMC Podcast Network. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA Podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G- GSMCpodcast.com for more info.
Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. I'm Ryan Mauser, and it's brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. So I gave you guys the three teams who I thought were the most disappointing to me so far in the first half of the season with us being at the All-Star break. Obviously, the All-Star game, that means, is coming up. Same with the All-Star festivities. But for me, I have an issue that there is even an All-Star game going on. We are obviously dealing with a lot still going on due to the coronavirus impact. And this idea that they are putting on an All-Star game just doesn't seem to be a good idea. There's still places for teams that can't even have fans at their stadiums at the moment. There's all the protocols that they're going through and making sure, hey, guys on the sidelines, still wear your masks. Still, you can't go and shake each other's hands after the game. You can't dap each other up and interact before the game or any of that. But let's have an exhibition game for no reason because we need to regain some what is it money from what was lost last season. They say they want to do it for the fans and they're putting a lot of the money towards HBCUs which is awesome, but the fact that there's a game and many of the players aren't thrilled that there's a game being played, but they know they have to play if they're selected. You get fined if you don't go and play. It's an exhibition game. Would would we make someone go and play in a preseason game if it didn't make sense? Look at the NFL. What'd they do this season? They canceled the preseason. They said, no, 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 we're just going to scrape it. It's, there's no reason for it. The Pro Bowl happened in the NFL. They didn't play the game. They had this, the Madden Pro Bowl and it all video games. And they did other things for it. To go and have an actual all-star game while you can't even have fans at home stadiums, while you can't go out when you're on the road, why? What What is the reason for it? The players don't want it. Do fans even care for the All-Star game? I probably will not even watch the All-Star game this weekend. And we've had issues with the All-Star game up until last year where they kind of figured out the new format to use. It just seems... It seems like a really, really dumb move by the NBA, who, as a league, has been pretty smart. I mean, they put together the bubble last year when people said, oh, that might not work. We don't know how that will do. It was a, it was a great success. They, they managed the COVID case. They didn't have many things pop up inside the bubble. Everything seemed to work out. And so you look at the NBA, you go, okay, this is a pretty smart league. And everything they do is, is usually geared toward with that logic of being smart and being progressive and making sure that the right precautions are taken. And with the All-Star game this year, it just seems... It seems like that was thrown out the window to get a game played. Because you heard guys like LeBron, like Giannis. De'Aaron Fox talked about it, although he's not an All-Star this year, that it just doesn't seem right to be playing an All-Star game this year. It doesn't make sense. We just had the shortest off season for a lot of these teams ever. Wouldn't we want to give these players rest? Wouldn't we want them to have more time off their feet, not having to play in a game? And granted, they're not going to go super hard in the game if they're playing. It's not going to be like a game seven of the finals. It's not even going to be the intensity of a playoff game or even a regular season game. But then what is the reason to have the game? On top of that, you're bringing all of the top players and having them be in one location. And I get that there's going to be testing and they're going to make sure and they do all the right protocols that nothing happens and nothing goes wrong and that they don't run into the issues of people contracting the virus. But you're having the top players of their teams all come to one location and then when they're finished go back to their teams and go back to their families and be rejoined. What We've already seen this year when a star player, look at what happened with Kevin Durant when he had the health and safety protocols pop up. Did you see how bad of a look that was? He was told, oh, he can't play in the game. Then he was allowed to play in the game. Well, then a 
test came back and it was questionable. So they pulled him from a game, and the Nets ended up losing that game. And the guys talked about it. They said it was weird. It was it was threw them off that they were going through this. That they had Katie, then they didn't, and then they were worried about him, trying to figure out what was going on. And it just seems like to put that kind of unnecessary burden into play doesn't make sense to me. For a league that is so usually thinking ahead of everything and on top of and looking towards the future, putting on an all-star game in the middle of a pandemic after you've just had one of the shortest off seasons, why? Why? What What is the reasoning for it? And they're doing the slam dunk contest and the three-point contest, and it's, it's okay, cool, they're going to have that stuff. They're not going to do the future, uh, the, the Rising Stars game. They announced the rosters, but they're not going to have the game because that doesn't make sense to have the game. But having the All-Star game makes sense? It, it, it blows my mind that, what are we what are we doing? What happens if one of these guys who knock on wood it doesn't happen but catches the case and goes back to their team and now let's say one team gets hit again. Are you gonna shut down the season? No, you're gonna keep going. Well, how is that gonna impact the rest of the way? Because you wanted to have an all star game go on that you risk putting one of your marquee star players in harm's way? And you're going to have fans at the All-Star game? Why? Why why are we having fans at the All-Star game? Why are we having people be there that is unnecessary to be there? We shouldn't be having the game. Why are we having people? Some of these games can't even have people at the games. And those games matter. And you'd want fans there. For an All-Star game... We can do the slam dunk contest. We can do the three-point contest. You could do the skills challenge if you wanted to. Just have them be at home. Have them be at a gym by themselves, recording it, videotaping it, doing whatever if you want to do that. But to bring all these bodies and all these people together, all these coaches, players, mix in some fans for an exhibition game? It just seems like the NBA is dropping the ball on this one. And I don't think the NBA usually drops the ball. I think they're usually ahead of it all and on top of things. But it just seems like this is not the most progressive thinking and that it could be, the time could be used better elsewhere. And I get that they're they're wanting to recoup some money. And they are donating money to a good cause. But you could donate the money to a good cause without having a game if you really wanted to. For a league that talks about players' safety and players' health and that's their number one priority, well, this doesn't seem like that's their number one priority. Making these players go play a game that many of them don't want to take part of, many of them would rather rest up heal from a short off season, heal from what's been going on in the season already. You got guys that are banged up at this point that could use a break that looked at it and thought, hey, we're not going to have an all-star game this year. Great. I can't wait till March 5th through the 10th to have those days off and to not put my body through anything and not have to play a game and not have to worry about anything. To, no, 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 we're going to have a game. We're going to have it be played. Fans are going to be there. You have to participate, or otherwise you're getting fined. And these guys can go in, and they can not play as hard as they want to and kind of walk through the motions like you've had other All-Star games in the past. But what's going to happen at that point is that people are going to complain and be like, well, why do we even have the All-Star game? Why did we have it played? But the guys didn't want to play. The players didn't want it. It just seems like we could have used this time better and smarter than throwing players out there in a meaningless exhibition game. 
And it seems like Adam Silver and the league has been kind of coming under fire lately, especially with this whole issue with the referees that's been popping off. That there's a lot of tension in the league right now. Guys are getting teed up quickly. Guys are getting ejected. Look at Devin Booker. He got two of the quickest technicals I've ever seen get hap- get called. You got many guys just being... I don't want to say riled up, but it's 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 some tense moments going on right now with the league. And putting an All-Star game on and forcing these guys to go take part in that doesn't seem like the smartest route to help all of that. The league has more things to worry about than an exhibition game. Let's figure out a way that every team can have fans at their stadiums because that would be awesome. There seems to be a weird advantage that some teams have fans, some don't. So instead of having an all-star game, let's just focus on trying to figure out that, making sure what's the right course of action so that come playoff time, Fans are allowed at every stadium if if given the go-ahead by state officials. It just doesn't make sense to put all these risks out there for how much of a, of a reward? What is, what is there all to gain from this? The All-Star Game, it's, it's a fun tradition, sure. The All-Star Game weekend... When you have the dunk contest, when you have the three-point, and everyone's excited and everyone's comes together to watch it. But no one can come together, really, to watch it and be a part of it. So why have it? So someone can get a trophy for being the MVP of the All-Star Game? So you can get some money back? So you can give it away? Let the players be honored. That they made an all-star team. That they were named an all-star. Because that's a great honor. Props to the players. They've all earned it to be that. But when guys say, I don't think it makes sense. I don't really want to play in it. But I'm going to have to play in it or else I get fined. Well then, what are we doing? Why are we even having a discussion about playing the game? It's it's one of those, you, you skip it. We don't need it. The NFL didn't need the Pro Bowl. Granted, the Pro Bowl no one ever wants because it's terrible and they need to figure out something better than that. MLB last year said, no, we're not going to do an all-star game because we already had the shortened season. Uh, It doesn't really make sense to be putting this on right now. So they said no all-star game. NBA, why not? Why not just say no all-star game? Do the dunk contest. Have it be set where each guy's at home doing their own thing. You could you could do other things besides having the guys come all to Atlanta and play in a game. Especially when the guys don't want to take part in it. It just seems like such an unaware move to make. The risk is way higher than the reward. What are we doing? What happens if one of these players does get the virus because they came to the All-Star game and then is forced to miss games or his health is impacted further because we threw on an exhibition game? You're potentially risking ruining the season that we've had already by putting on an All-Star game that guys don't want to take part in? I just... Adam Silver and the league need to figure this out. And it shouldn't be even going on. And I, I'm I'm frankly, I'm not happy that there's an all-star game. I don't care for it. It's unnecessary. I'd rather the guys get their rest and come back healthy and rejuvenated for a great second half of the season than to watch some guys go and give half an effort into an exhibition game. That's that's where I'm at with this. And I get there's a bunch that goes into it and there's reasoning why they want to have the game and they're going to put money to it, great causes. I'm all for that. But you can do that without having the game. 
you can do that without having a game that players don't want to take part in already. Because it just doesn't make sense. And there's no reason for it. There's nothing wrong with having one year of no All-Star game. Because you just say, hey, it didn't make sense to have an All-Star game. We didn't think it was the right move. But that's not the way that they're looking at it. And that's not how they're feeling. They think it's the right move. I disagree. I hope it all works out. I hope nothing pops up and no issues happen and it goes smooth as all can be. And let's say there is it is a great game and everything goes back and no one gets hurt and no one gets sick and it's all positive and we have a great second half of the season. And that very well can happen and easily could happen come this Sunday. But to put the risk out there and to have that risk just doesn't make sense to me and seems misguided. But there's people who get paid a lot more money than me to make that decision, and they made it, so let's hope that this weekend it is good, it is great, nothing does go wrong, and everyone enjoys themselves, and it all works out. And they come back and have a great second half of the season, Because that's what we all hope for. That's all we want. Is let's have a great season and some great basketball that continues to be played. But to have an all-star game in the middle of a pandemic just makes no sense to me. And it's, 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 to me, it's a bad look. But hopefully I'm, I'm wishing for the best. And I want to take a quick, quick break and then come back. I want to get into... What is more important or what is more exciting to you? A big three or a big dunk? I was having this conversation with a couple buddies of mine. Shout out to Zach. Shout out to Yamo. And I got a couple different answers from them. And it made me think. And I'm still on the fence about it. But I'll come to a determination by the end of the show of which one I think is better. Is it is it a dunk? Is it a three? And I'm not talking about it like a buzzer beater. That... That should be its own category. That's that's true. It should be separate and not mixed into these. But what in, in the middle of a game, and it, it, it is based on situation and time and place and everything, but a big, huge dunk or a big three, which one gets you more excited and which one is more important? We're going to take a quick break. This is the best. This is the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Stay tuned. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Alrighty, welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I want to thank you guys so much for sticking around, tuning in, and listening. It's always appreciative, appre- uh, appreciated, excuse me, long day. Always appreciated, and to go give us a follow on Twitter at, at GSMC underscore basketball. Go follow us on Facebook, Instagram, give us likes, give us shares, do whatever you can. We always appreciate it to get the content out there. Especially, I appreciate it especially. Thank you so much for allowing me to talk some hoops with you and rant and say whatever I'm I'm thinking. It's, and what I was thinking about the other day 
I came across the Vince Carter dunk for the USA Olympic team. And that is one of the most iconic dunks looked made look way too easy for a guy to fully jump over someone. And so I was talking to a buddy of mine, uh, shout out again to Zach, and we were going back and forth, and we were talking. And I asked, I said, what is more exciting, a, a, a big dunk or when a big three happens? And I know, obviously, right off the bat, you go, well, a three is worth more than a dunk, obviously, unless you get an and one, I guess, and you can make a free throw, and then it's three and three. But a three is, you hit a three, that's three points. That's that's that. But when you have the, that dunk, like the Anthony Edwards dunk from earlier this year to where he slammed on uh, Watanobe, and you have something like that, the DeAndre Jordan dunk on Brandon Knight, Blake Griffin's on Timothy Mozgov, Baron Davis on Andre Karolinko, those types of dunks, they, they live in your memory. You have those pin there and you you remember where you were or what you were doing and your reaction to those a big three happens and it can be a game changer and has huge stakes in itself because you make a big three you just added three points you you extended that lead you think it can be heartbreaking for a team and so it got me thinking well what, what is more momentum shifting or what's bigger in the moment of a game and it, it's always going to be situational. You're probably going to remember the big highlight dunk more than the big made three unless it was a buzzer beater, which that's going to be in its own separate category that I can go into of top buzzer beaters ever, which we may may do that this week with no NBA games and going on for the All-Star break. But as I was sitting there thinking, going back and forth and trying to figure out do I get more excited for a big three to happen or a big dunk? And like I said, there there are some of those memorable dunks that just sit in the back of your mind and you look back and think, wow, that was an incredible feat that not everyone can do. And I think that's part of what what makes a dunk so special is that there's only a limited, limited number of people on this earth that can dunk a basketball truly at the normal regulation height. And so it makes it more unique. Because if you really wanted to, you could put up a thousand threes a day and get pretty good at shooting threes. And you could make threes. You're not going to make them in an NBA game, obviously, for <laughs> many reasons. But you can get pretty good at shooting a three, and you can constantly hit threes, and you can go play a pickup game and Go play at the gym and hit some threes and feel good about yourself. But you won't be able to have that feeling of dunking a basketball for the most part unless you are capable of that. But as I sit back and I think, what what excites me more? What, what draws out more emotion from me, a big dunk or a big three? I just keep sitting back to, it depends on the timing, I guess. But I... I when when let's that that DeAndre Jordan dunk happened on Brandon Knight, it was a moment that stood still. When Sean Kemp dunked on Sony Lister, it was a moment in itself of oh my god! I remember. No, I don't personally remember that, but it's it's that moment of people who witnessed it remembered that exact moment of when it happened. Of that was you go on Twitter. And there's a this day in sports history. And that dunk is featured every day on the day it happened. And you're going to go in in a year from that day. You're going to, oh, there we go. There's the reminder of it. So a big dunk is going to live forever. Now, a big three may not live forever. But it may have a bigger impact on the game itself. And it may have led to a win more than the dunk. And so it made me think of, okay, well, what, what's some of the biggest, biggest NBA threes in the history of the game? And how, and how where were they at? What situation was it? D- did it have the same impact as the three? Or, excuse me, as the dunk? 
Because the Baron Davis dunk on Andre Kirilenko that happened in the playoffs, that game was already out of reach. It didn't change the course of the game or the series. But it was a huge, huge moment. It was something that lives on in Warrior fans' minds of one of the greatest playoff dunks ever. Even though that game was already out of reach and wasn't... It wasn't anything... Series changing because the Warriors, the Warriors went on to lose that series four games to one. But you look at the the Ray Allen three for the Miami Heat in the finals. Obviously, that's a huge three and led to so many more moments for the Heat as they they ended up winning that game and then winning the series and. That moment, that three lives on forever, but a huge three in the middle of a game. And the way I described it to friends of mine in my thinking was when you're down in a game, and let's say your your team's trailing by 15, and you're make, they're making a run, and they're coming back, and they're fighting them fighting, and they finally hit that three that gives them the lead for the first time in the game. Is there no better feeling? And obviously if they hit a dunk in that same situation that gave them the lead for the first time, it's an awesome moment also. But a three, it just seems to put that that extra oomph on it. And I guess back in the day when threes weren't as important or as push as they are nowadays I mean nowadays the league is all about threes now it's it's who can shoot who can shoot the best threes who who's taking the most and everyone shoots a three now everyone will take it but when you're rallying and you you finally hit that shot that puts you over the top and gives you the lead for the first time in there and the the crowd is rocking and all the momentum is behind you I think that tops a dunk if a dunk happened at that point yeah even if it gave you the lead you're feeling great and you're wow there's something about that when the ball goes up and just splashes in that gets everyone going all the fans going crazy the bench is dancing and celebrating it just seems that those dunks don't happen at the same moments. It, it it's not a tight, close game that they always happen. It's not this hard fought battle where the dunk is the thing that puts it over the top. The dunk seems to be the the cherry on top of a of a game, whether it was a win or a loss for you. There's that moment of oh, I can look back and yep, that was a that was a great dunk that happened, and that was something that oh we can look back on and even though it was a bad game and it was a rough game we had that moment we had that one play or we reverse it when your team is up by eight and you're having three minutes left in the game and this team is fighting and your opponent is coming back on you and they're they're approaching and it's now a five-point game and your team drives down and hits that three that just seems to halt all the momentum. Don't you just feel the life gets sucked out of that team? Who they battled back, they were right there trying to get over the top, and you hit that three, and it just seems the game is over now. Not officially, but it seems like their heart was taken out of it by a dagger three. I just feel like you don't get that same feeling happening from a big dunk. Now maybe it's the fact of oh well three again it's it's three points as opposed to two. But it just seems like there's something about when that three happens cuz you can do everything right on defense. You can guard the guys for 23 seconds on the shot clock and that three goes up and it's hit and then when it goes through you're drained. 
to where a dunk's mostly going to happen early in the shot clock or on a fast break or out of a scramble. It's not the same effect of you put in all the effort to stop this team and they hit the three that just crushes you. But again, some of the those don't those threes don't sit in your brain. It's not, oh, remember that moment when that when he hit that three, when Steph Curry hit that three against the Kings that stopped that stopped their momentum, that pushed the lead to eight. You remember the buzzer beaters. And you remember the threes that were big moments, like Steph Curry's three against the Thunder, which was a game-winning three, but those are different. That's I'm talking about in the middle of the game type of threes, or towards the end of a game, where it's not it's not the game winner, but it's a huge three. It's a big three. Because you don't get those game-winning dunks like that. Those highlight dunks aren't game-winning ones. Those are moments. And so I'm looking at a moment three. Which one gets you more excited or which one hurts you more as a fan? If you're the team, if your team gets dunked on and has the highlight, is that the same as when that three happens? No, probably not. Because when that three happens, that big moment three, it changes the game. It impacts it. It causes you to have a loss. Flip it. It causes you to have a win. To where when that dunk happens, it tends to be more of just a moment and you don't care what happened in the game afterwards you go remember that dunk that just happened and so it's maybe it's because of the moment of threes are all the rage right now or if a big dunk happened I'd go crazy watching it because that was the most insane dunk I've seen but for me I think I think that big momentum either halting or boosting three, I will go with all the time. Because I've seen it happen. Your team's having that rally. They're finally, they're they're within reach, and then that three happens, and you just go, we're done. The game's over, and it's more of an impact because it leads to a loss. As opposed to when the big dunk moment happens, I at that point, you really don't care if a win or loss happened, unless it's a big game, unless it was a, a playoff game. But these those don't just happen as much. The threes that stop the momentum and stop a team from being able to reach that comeback, they happen far more often. And there's a reason why it's kind of, you don't sit back and you don't remember the exact moment of that three happening. But I still feel that that impact is bigger and hits you. Now again, I'm saying I, I I am a huge fan of dunks. There's, I wish I could dunk. Who doesn't wish they would dunk? That feeling must be amazing. And the dunk contest, like we're having this weekend, used to be the top event. It used to be the thing that everyone looked forward to. And oh, what what are they going to pull out? What tricks are they going to do? Who's is someone going to jump over a car or a person? Or all of that. To where nowadays it seems, the dunk contest like a dunk, has taken backseat to the three-point shootout or the three, uh, three-pointer. three Because you watch and you go, okay, what's going to happen in the three-point shootout? Who's going to win? Who's gonna, How much can they put on to it? And all they're doing is just doing the same shots that they always do is shooting the three. To a dunk, they're getting more creative or they're trying to be creative. But for me, it, it's that that momentum halting or that momentum boosting of that that big three and that big moment will always sit and impact me more than the big dunk. And I don't blame you if you feel the dunk is way more important and you have more memories of and you can pinpoint exactly when that huge dunk happened and you you know exactly did they did your team win the game? Did you care that they won the game at that point? Or was it just the moment? Again, there's nothing wrong with it. I just I look back and I go, those threes that happen, and it may not sit exactly in your brain. You may not be able to pinpoint the exact moment or game. But you remember that the feeling of oh when he hit that, when you go back and rewatch it, 
which one hits you more? I think it'll always be the three for me because of the impact that I felt during the game and that it seemed to mean a bit more in the context of a win or a loss. Dunks are fun. Those highlight dunks, I can go and watch those all day long, and they're a blast. But the one that really, really hurts me or excites is that big three that just can drain a fan and drain a team as well as get them absolutely unglued in the moment. So I'd have to go with the three. And I love dunks, and I'm always a fan of watching a big dunk happen. And when you see a guy on a fast break, and you just know, oh, he's about to do something awesome and slam it. But when you have that three that just gets hit and gets a swish. There just seems to be nothing like it, especially when you have the ball movement or it's at the end of a shot clock and, oh, he hit that three and they did everything right. It just seems to hurt or excite a bit more. And it's interesting because I think back in the day, back when I was probably younger, I would have said the dunk just because it's more rare. It's not happening as often. But it's also that I've now understood that oh in the, in the grand scheme of it all that three is way more important because of the context of what happened in the game and the impact it ended up having it's funny you can you can go back and forth with it all day long and if you go back and watch and, and find them and find those moments and find those highlights and it's fun to go back and sit through and Feel that anguish or feel that excitement again and oh I remember when that three happened and or I remember when that dunk happened. It's just one of those I found it very interesting and it made me think. And it shows you how you've kind of grown as a fan of the sport or appreciate the little things in a game. Because when you when you are watching the game, you're not necessarily thinking back about, wow, that was a momentum stopping three. But that one sits back and and sits with you for a minute when you go back and think about it or look at it and go, oh, I can pinpoint exactly when we kind of lost the game right there. Is that you go and you circle it and go, oh, if that moment, if he misses that one, who knows what's going to happen? And that's that's the part that gets me the most as a fan of basketball, that that part right there. That when you can look and go, oh, if, if, if only this happened different. If only he didn't hit that three and you just watch a team and watch the guy's facial expressions and watch everyone's reactions when that shot happens. And it shows you that that is so impactful on it. Everyone gets excited for the big dunk. It's played on sports center all night long and it's, it's on every Instagram and Twitter and getting retweeted and all over and house of highlights is throwing stuff up and all these places are, you can go and watch it. But that three, that big shot three that happens, it doesn't necessarily win the game, but is a big moment in the game, I think I'll always side with. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen. Really appreciate it. Go ahead and go and follow us at GSMC basketball underscore, excuse me, at GSMC underscore basketball. Go ahead and give me a follow if you can. It's at Mr. underscore Meowser. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it. We'll be back with another episode next week. Enjoy the All-Star Game if you're watching. I don't care for it. I am not a fan of the fact that it's going on. But, hey, if you are, go enjoy. Go watch the three-point contest and the slam dunk. Tweet me. Let me know which one you think is more exciting for you. In the meantime, enjoy the weekend, and I'll talk to you guys later. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.